Well, hello everybody, this is Tim Green and Rattle Magazine, and welcome to you, to the Critique of the Week. It is uh, December 1st, thanks everybody for joining me. We're streaming live from our uh, second location in Texas. Um, it took a little bit to uh, get the Facebook stream going. They wanted a new stream key, but it looks like it's running. Cindy Putnam Guntherman is here. Hey, Cindy, good to see you. Over on YouTube, we've got uh, Katie Dozier, of course. Uh, hey, Katie, we've got Tom Barlow here, who uh, has two poems we're going to be looking at. we got Mary Keating, we have Monica Dobos. I uh, hope you, uh, Monica Dobos, feel a little under the weather. Hope you feel better soon, Monica. Uh, D. Coleman's here. We got Dick Wexheimer. We got Nancy Subanek. We have, uh, let's see, M's dad. Sharon Ferrante's here. Rose Lenard. Uh, Jean de Van Breda from, I think, South, uh, South Africa. Good to see you, Jean de. Um, Aiden Hunt is here. Hello. Okay. So, I think everything is working fine now. Let me double check Facebook to make sure it's still going. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, sorry for a little delay. Sometimes Facebook randomly asks me to update the, the stream key. And they did that, so... <laughs> Alright, so we're going to take two uh, a look at two poets today. It's a typical critique of the week. Um, this is one of those ones where we like to take focus on two poets that have some interesting poems and then uh, see what they have in common, too, between the two poems. Uh, so as always, the point is to give that workshop experience, uh, which is so valuable, of letting everybody know... Um, uh, what you feel about the poems, what works, what doesn't, what's your reaction, where are you stimulated and excited and engaged, where are you starting to get bored and lose the, your focus. All those things are so important because we don't really get good feedback from friends and family because they all just want to make us happy, and they should. <laughs> but we want to make you happy by making you better poets. And so that is our goal around here. Hopefully we can help. And we also have um, Charlotte Kaus today too from the UK. So she is joining us. She's the second of the two poets. We have both poets in the house. So, um, you know, you can feel free. It's not one of those workshops where we say you can't say anything. It's against the rules to say anything about it. If you have any, you know, you want to clarify something, um, you know, we'll, we'll be talking about it before you have a chance to clarify anything or anything anyway. So uh, feel free to add anything if you're we're sort of going off the wrong track. Uh, anything we can do to help out is our goal. So uh, feel free to leave any comments if you're the actual poet, too. Um, so let's see. So we're look at Tom Barlow's poems first. And Tom uh, sent some hyben, which are funny. And you know we love the hyben form. And um, it's really a form with a lot of life, actually. The uh, haiku community, you know, hyben were pretty popular. But I'd say in the last few years, hyben are really taking off a lot of experimenting. They're sort of people realize there's a lot of ground and a lot of ways you could play beyond just the paragraph and haiku that's the traditional style. But let's take a look at Tom Barlow's. And... Um, here you go. These are, this is Tom Barlow's first one, bonds, The Bonsai Garden. And if you're fam unfamiliar with the hyben form, if you're new to this, uh, the hyben is, uh, it comes from the tradition, um, at Basho, I believe, invented it, um, you know, 300, 250, how long ago did he live? 250, 300 years ago? Um, and, and, but they would tr travel journals. So he would publish these travel journals where he would write about the places he went and visited and then include haiku along with the journalistic kind of prose interspersed with the haiku. Um, and that became the haibun, or haibun. And, um, and then so it's this way of combining two completely different styles of poetry. You have the really concise haibun, and then you have prose. Um, you know, just have literary journaling type things where you get to experience sort of what's going on and then have some kind of haiku coming in too to add something to it. And what's really fascinating is the way that, that the haibun has become, just in recent years, something that a lot of English language haiku poets are experimenting with in a lot of profound and interesting ways. Um, you know, there's the braided haibuns that, that the lines of the haiku are intermixed within the prose. There's um, all these sort of concrete type haibuns. There's adding, instead of just using prose poems and then having the haibun separated off as a, as a um, haibun, we have in the collaboration issue coming up, we have a lot of haibun too. Uh, where it's um, someone writing the um, prose and someone writing the haiku. And so, um, and by the way, if you're one of those, we haven't let everybody know yet which ones we picked. And I, it's going to be another week before I'm able to do that. So sit tight and be patient. But we do have some hyben for the collaborative poetry issue too. Anyway, now let's look at uh, Tom Barlow's hyben, the first one, the bonsai garden. And so there's the bonsai garden. <clears throat> Basho in Kyoto longed for Kyoto when he heard the cuckoo. I watched it bathe, flap, flapping wings in the pond water, chirping its ignorant joy. We did not drop our bomb on Kyoto, though the argument against beauty was fierce. So those ghosts fly elsewhere. In their absence, the cuckoo, that bird of unrequited love, 
watches me from a cherry limb as I wander through the bonsai, trying to imagine the man who could take an axe, small as my little finger, to these ancient trees. And then the haiku, the boy tugs his mother's sleeve, come see the mushroom cloud. So that's really interesting. I like really like the haiku. And I, I mention this pretty much every time Hyben comes up, but when I get a Hyben as submission, um, I read the haiku first, just because so pe- many people don't sort of understand how haiku works. And there's so many bad haiku where it's um doesn't have any kind of, it's like just syllables, you know, just counting syllables and there's nothing else going on. And the haiku is really about the cut. And, and, uh, and so you have to have this kind of juxtaposition between the two, um, the two uh, parts of the haiku. Um, so we have this, um, you know, the boy tugs his mother's sleeve. And then we also have come see the mushroom clouds. So there's a sort of overlapping cut, which is something that's really interesting that we can do in English. Um, you know, Japanese is a very different language. They have these actual words that sort of serve as punctuation. And so it's more difficult to do this kind of overlapping thing. And when haiku come into um, English, you can use sort of the spirit of haiku and, and use, you know, the different ways that English works to make interesting haiku based on the language and the structure of the syntax itself. And this is something that does it. So we have this overlapping where the boy's tugging at his mother's sleeve to come see and then also come see the mushroom cloud. Um, or the cut could be here. You know, you could think of it as the mushroom cloud, its own thing standing by itself. But it's a really great, really great haiku because of that. Like it has this sort of two worlds in one breath or my definition of haiku because it's really this merger that's sort of at the heart of metaphor, this sort of way of symbolically looking at you know, beyond speech, the way two things are compared, and there's something similar and something going on, you know, both things at the same time. It's like that everything, everywhere, all at once kind of thing crammed into three lines is what a haiku really is. And uh, and this is a great example of it. So it's really powerful to have, you know, you don't, you don't expect the mushroom cloud coming like nobody, of course, you know, tragically expected the mushroom cloud coming either in, in Hiroshima or Nagasaki. And so you have the power of that, you know, um, into the you know, and you can imagine a little boy, um, you know, being amazed at this site that's really death and destruction, like in the distance, too. So there's that aspect of it as well. Um, so, so anyway, great haiku. And the, that the haiku works, um, you know, makes makes the hyphen work. The hyphen really can't work without a good haiku. And then the, the really interesting thing about hyphen, too, is you have these cuts between the haiku. You know, the haiku, there's a cut inside of it where sort of there's a leap of imagination. That's what if, if somebody says a cut related to haiku, that's really what they mean. There's like a leap of imagination. There's some kind of like comparison or juxtaposition or some kind of like leap that's like, I was thought I was here and then I was here. And really that's kind of what poems are doing, but haiku really compress that. And so we have that leap of imagination inside of it. Then we have the leap of an imagination between the two. And then we have a leap of imagination with a title connecting to the both of them. So there's sort of a possibility of three or four leaps of imagination within this. And, um, and I think that works pretty well. So, um, okay, so the Bonsai Garden, um, interesting title. Um, and let's see. Um, and then we get back to it with the ancient trees, and, you know, s- these tiny acts as small as my little finger to these ancient trees. So, so imagining the, uh, the way a haiku or a, ha- or a bonsai is clipped too at the very end. So we get back to the Bonsai Garden. Let's take a look at the, at the pros. Uh, the Banzai Garden. Basho in Kyoto longed for Kyoto when he heard the cuckoo. I watched it bathe, flapping its wings in the pond water, chirping its ignorant joy. We did not drop our bomb on Kyoto, though the argument against beauty was fierce, so those ghosts fly elsewhere. I think, um, so, so you still want, even though it's prose, you want the, uh, the prose to be as intense as possible and still kind of condensed like you would in a prose poem, maybe. And that's the way to get it the strongest. To me, I think the prose is a little too wordy, and I would trim that back a little bit. Um, let's see. <clears throat> so, um, um, so I think I would get rid of the... Um, let, let's do this. Let's, let me just take out... Let me, let me give a another version so we can look back at the original too but this i would take out um um this right here um we did not drop our bomb on kyoto i think the though the argument against beauty was fierce um i think that i think that that it, it sort of moves to an abstract level there's not a lot of real tangible stuff to get rid of it or to include you know, to make you think more um and so I would trim this back and just go uh, and leave that kind of implied. We did not drop our bomb on Kyoto so those ghosts fly elsewhere. It's a much more powerful statement 
Um, and, uh, and, and it's sort of the rest is implied. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Everyone's saying that the, um, the repetition of Kyoto, I think, I think several people have pointed this out. The, um, um, let's see. So Aiden Hunt says, I wouldn't use Kyoto three times either unless it's critical. Um, Brian, so Sullivan says, maybe just remove, we did not drop our bomb on Kyoto and keep the though the argument was, was fierce. I, I like that. Uh, see, the thing is, if you know the haiku, and I didn't think it was Basho. Um, I thought it was, I could be wrong. Though. I thought it was um, Busan or let me see. Let's see. Um, was it Basho? I'll just double check. Oh, it was Basho. Okay. So the, the, the famous um, haiku from Basho that it's referencing is this right here. We'll put up, um, um, I don't know why I thought it was somebody else, but we'll put it up. This was, um, I'll put it over here to put it up. There we go. So this is, um, even in Kyoto, hearing the cuckoo's cry, I long for Kyoto. So that repetition is intentionally a reference, a callback to this famous haiku, which, which I should know is Basho. Um, and so in Basho, Basho and Kyoto longed for Kyoto when he heard the cuckoo. So that's just a paraphrase of it. And to me, I think the repetition works. I think adding on to that, like you're sort of, it, it's making stronger the connection by, by sort of doubling up, like doubling down on that. And so I, to me, I like it. Um, but a lot of people heard it differently and, and found it a little, you know, aggravating or something. And so that's, that's fine too. So think about that, I guess. Um, but to, to me, I like the, the nod back and the way that it sort of pushed the haiku forward because that, that haiku is based on that repetition. You know, and again, it's um, even in Kyoto, hearing the cuckoo's cry, I long for Kyoto. And so, and the repetition is part of the haiku. I mean, part of the power of this is that it's the same thing that I'm in and I'm still longing for it. And the repetition of that, um, I don't know, there's something, I mean, that's where the, the ma of the haiku is, is the fact that the, the, the repetition, that, I'm, that I, it's there, it, it's always fleeting, you know? And every time you say the word Kyoto, the word Kyoto is gone. Or every time you say anything, that word's gone. And so that's part of what the, why the haiku works so well. Um, I'm not sure what this uh, website is. This is East's, Hut, East's Untidy Hut, by the way. It's a Lilliput review, if you were wondering. But anyway, um, it's some essay where it includes that, that haiku. But um, so, so I like the repetition of it, personally. And I think I would keep that. But, um, you know, take feedback for what it is. Um, let's see. Yeah. Okay. Um, so anyway, so what we're doing, I think, to make this poem stronger is to trim out some of the sort of the fat from the prose. And so make the prose as sort of intensely interesting as, um, as the rest of the poem as a whole. Um, you know, as interesting as the haiku. Um, and I think it's really cool to call it the bonsai garden, too, because it's, you know, about the you know, World War II and, and what happened in the bomb and, and all of that. And then to, to have a sort of separate location and to think of the way to the world. Um, like imagine how, you know, generals have the map of the world and the cities are going to blow up um, in this sort of miniature scale on their desk in the wherever the Pentagon. And so that kind of has come to mind too, that miniaturization where it's like there's a dehumanization to miniaturization, which is part of this, this really interesting hive in two. And so, uh, so it's really interesting. And I think just trimming some of this stuff out. So let me read it again with the Kyotos and see. Uh, uh, now, now that you know, maybe if you didn't know that that was the famous haiku, um, then it would feel um, like we don't want the three. Um, but anyway, Basho and Kyoto long for Kyoto when he heard the cuckoo. I watch it bathe fla flapping wings in the pond water, chirping its ignorant joy. We did not drop our bomb on Kyoto. Maybe the thing is there's too much distance. Maybe we could trim a little bit out too here. Um, um, like maybe instead of chirping its ignorant joy, we could move this. What if we made it sort of one sentence so it just moved quicker and we went, um, it was flapping. Oops, we don't want to. <laughs> we want to. Uh, this. What if it was flapping its ignorant joy in the pond water? So we get quicker, and then we get to the Kyoto quicker, too. And then it would be more of the, the callback would, I think, work a little more strongly, too. <clears throat> uh, we don't, I'm not, so what do you think about that? 
Rose Leonard says, I tripped by the cocoa, uh, cuckoo. Do you say cuckoo or cuckoo? I don't know. Chirping. Um, do they chirp? I thought they just went cuckoo. Hmm. Yeah. Um, Katie says chirping instead of flapping. Yeah, maybe chirping is better. Because it is bathing, so you already get the image. Um, yeah, that's a good point. So it's I watch it bathe, chirping its ignorant joy in the pond water. We did not drop our bomb on Kyoto, so those ghosts fly elsewhere. In their absence, the cuckoo, that bird of unrequited love, watches me from a cherry limb as I wander through the bonsai, trying to imagine the man who could take an axe small as my little finger to these ancient trees. Yeah. So, um, cuckoo. Yeah, cuckoo, says Aiden Hunt. Thanks, thanks, Aiden. Yeah, I thought so, but I think I've seen it spelled like that with 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 four O's, and so I wonder if I'm thinking if it's a different bird. I don't know. Anyway, so I think we I think we just by cutting those couple things out condense this well. To me, I like the call back to Kyoto again, and I think that for the transition for the flow of the poem, it's sort of necessary too. Because, of course, that's not where the bombs were dropped. And so we kind of need to reference that and recognize that. Or it just feels like an arbitrary Kyoto, but then we're really talking about other places. So I think it works to do that. And then you can say in their absence, I, I think that's a nice transition. The, the, there's a real arc to the, <clears throat> to the prose. And um, I, think, I think it works really well this way. And then as someone else said, I think it was um, Jean-Dave Van Breda said, the, the best part, even though how good the haiku is, I really like the haiku, um, the the best part is this um, trying to imagine the man who could take an axe small as my little finger to these ancient trees, which, of course, calls back to the person which you kind of forget about. You, you have the bomb, you hear the bird, then you kind of forget about the bomb, then you get back to the mushroom cloud here at the end. And so there's this real progression and, and you know, jumping. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and so, um, so so it's a great line right here, too. And, and I think, I mean, that's all I would do this poem myself. Um, as I think it works really well. The, I think one, I think maybe instead of the boy, I would say a boy. <clears throat> um, and keep it lowercase, because usually we don't capitalize in haiku. It's not a sentence. Um, so um, I, would, I would do it like that. Um, but otherwise, I think this works really well. It ni nicely fits on the screen, too. Um, let's see. Yeah, so check the faces. The cuckoo is their chirp. They're named after their chirp. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think I don't have a problem calling that a chirp. I, I, you know, to me, I think this is the poem. This is what I would do with it. Um, other people are still suggesting. Um, who? Let's see. Where was it? Somebody suggested. Um, yeah, somebody suggested cutting the second sentence. And I think, but I think we need that too. Like we're seeing, we're, there's a sort of progression going on. We're thinking about Kyoto and the cuckoo. We see one, and then we're thinking about the bomb and how it, it didn't wasn't dropped on Kyoto. And and I think that's th there's a lot there to it. And I think that really works as a transition. Just think of it like instead of a instead of a poem, think of it as like a movie or a novel with certain sort of plot points you have to hit to carry the arc of the plot. And I think you need sort of need every sentence here to do that. And so I think it was we trimmed out the stuff we didn't need. We had a few sentences extra in this original version. We cut out, you know, we condensed this and we cut out this. I think to me, I mean, someone suggested cutting this section, you know, and just saying, you know, go, I watch it bathe, flapping wings in the pond water, tripping its ignorant joy. Though the argument against beauty was fierce. Um, well, I don't know if you could even do that. I, th I think you need that that section. So I think I would just cut this section. Anyway, that's what I would do this poem. If, um, yeah. Adam's dad says, uh, very good, I would still tighten it up a little. Yeah, I mean, so you can still tinker with it. But the only thing that's that I think could use tinkering is getting this as nice and tight as possible in the same way that you would with any poem. Like, you want every sort of phoneme that we have to say something loaded with meaning as much as possible. <clears throat> um, and, um, and I think, uh, you know, so, so maybe there's some more tightening you can do. I think it's pretty good at this point. Um, and and I, I like it. So I think that it's a good poem, The Bonsai Garden. Let's look at the other one. And we have already talked about Hyman now, so we can just jump right in. This is also Hyman. Um, and and Tom, what Tom asked was, um, where did it go? He just said, very simply, I'd be interested in knowing how well these poems conform to the Hyman form. And I think, uh, you know, conforming to a form... 
I mean, like I was saying before, the, what's really interesting about the Hyben as a form is it's really vibrant and people are trying a lot of different things. I mean, there's a Hyben journal online and there's, um, you know, the poetry editor of uh, Modern Haiku is um, Roberta Beery and the poetry editor of Frog Pond is Lou Watts. And they're both really pushing the boundaries for what Hyben um, can do and, and trying a lot of different things. Um, and also, you know, Kat Lehman, who we publish frequently, is experimenting with a lot of different ways. And so there's this way that we sort of realize there's so much potential within Hyben that uh, and it's not something that was really tapped yet, which is a nice kind of thing that, you know, you, you do try new things with this form and it's things people haven't seen before. So there's a lot you can play with. These are pretty traditional and I think they work on a, well, the first one, at least they haven't read the second one, but they work on a, um, you know, on the traditional level. Usually, you know, Hyben, this is the sort of the, the most common way it's done. We have, if you can look back, just type in Hyben it rattle.com in the search bar and you will see, you know, dozens of maybe two dozen Hyben come up and some of them are long. Like we have some, that are, one's like eight pages long and it's interspersed with haiku. Um, but the most common form is they have the short prose poem section, which is almost like a prose poem, like very concrete, usually really condensed. And then one haiku. And it's the contrast between all three that really makes that sort of magic happen. So this is the most common type of hyphen. Um, and I think it conforms really well to that. But my point is that uh, I don't know if you should try to conform, like try to find new ways to experiment with it too. And that's interesting as well. But, but it's great to do this this way too. But yeah, it, it fits well with what people are doing and have been doing for the last few decades. Okay, so let's do this next one. The Cherry Red Camaro. Engine work done. I listen to my Camaro riff before I give us both a hose and bath. Sorry, give us both a hose bath. I scrawl another X on the Valvoline calendar, and there I am, passed out drunk again in the back seat, White Castle sleeves stinking up the floor. Last night I begged the bartender to cut me off after three drinks, so she lined up three long necks on the bar like I was Joey Tre Chestnut. Of course, it didn't stop there. Sometimes waking the next morning is like a nail gun fired into the webbing of my thumb. When my boss calls from the roof of a McMansion to see where I am, he tells me not to bother coming in anymore. I take this an as an occasion to celebrate maybe breakfast at the car track, burritos with the ghost peppers, and wonder if I really know what love is anymore. I call out to my wife, hey, Carmen, are we still living the dream? V8 swinging from a tree limb, Christmas decorations. So again, a very nice hyphen. Um, yeah, so, so uh, you know, V8, so we get the Camaro coming back. And then, is a, is a, can a tree limb hold a V8 engine? <laughs> is that, uh, is that something people do to use a, a tree as an engine lift? Like, I mean, I know it's something, that's something you should do. <laughs> but is it something people actually do? Because I think that's a lot of weight to put on a um, on a tree limb, and I, I would be very aware of that. But if it's something that you know <laughs> risk takers do, then I think it works great for the poem. Um, and then to call it a cr Christmas decorations, it's just really fun too. So V8 swinging from a tree limb, Christmas decorations again, um, a, a nice haiku at the end. You know, one it's even though it's two lines. Um, I, I read an essay in Frog Pond from I don't know maybe five or six years ago. Um, about the two-line haiku, which is something you don't see a lot. You see a lot of monoku. It's probably, I don't know, 20% of haiku these days. And then you see a lot of three-line haiku. And, um, you know, in the traditional Japanese, it's really interesting that, you know, they, they write them in one line. But then it's one line because they're divided by these mora or on, which are kind of like measures of music. So there's sort of... Um, it's like like three bars of music is really what what it is along one sheet. So it's like imagine a, a you know music across the sheet of a page, and it's like three bars or three measures. What's the difference between a bar and a measure? I'm not a music person, but you know I think you know what I mean. And so that's sort of the the traditional way of breaking it down. But of course there are all sorts of forms of haiku in the Japanese originally too, and um, there's really no reason in English not to make it you know have it have two lines when that's appropriate and makes it really fit. And you know you could. Um, you could change this and just add a break here. So it's, um, V8 swinging from a tree limb like that, or you could have it, um, you know, switch around from a tree limb V8 swinging Christmas decorations. I think that works too, but I think this is nice too. Um, I, I don't know. I like the pacing of it. And so I think it works really well as a two line haiku, which you don't see very often, but who cares? Um, so I think that's really nice too. Um, let me see the comments. Um, 
A dua, says Sharon Ferrante. Yeah. Um, and then Marion Keating says, or is the V8 a, in, is a miniature in a Christmas decoration? Yeah, that's a good point. I, I saw it as an actual um, engine, like an engine block that someone's like changing the car, but using the tree limb to hoist it up. And uh, that maybe it is a decoration. I like that too. And it's really another example of why it's such a good haiku, uh, because there's different ways of reading it. Even though it's two lines, there's all these like overlapping layers of reality to it. So, um, the question is decoration or ornament. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Is ornament maybe a better word here? Christmas ornaments. Or just one ornament. I mean, is that better? I mean, the, the decor, I mean, the ornament's a little, it kind of fits with both, but I think fits the, um, it's hang, it's a miniature hanging on the tree a little, a little better. Christmas ornament. So maybe think of that. I think they could go either way. But I, I like that, too. <clears throat> D. Coleman says, I took the haiku as the after effect of drinking the car driven into a tree. Um, yeah. And then Jander says, maybe Tom played with both meanings. I think so. I, I think I just didn't happen to see it that way. But but once you see it, you can't unsee it. Kitty Dutcher says, I prefer ornament. Yeah, I think I'd like ornament better, too. I think I agree. Okay. So I think we make that tiny change there. Um is V8, the one thing about V8, isn't the V8 also the um, tomato juice or that with the vitamins or whatever? Isn't that V8? Um, is anybody thrown off by that or is that not, um, does that not matter? That was one thing I thought too. For a second, I, you know, when I first read V8, I, the, my first thought was the juice. And then I realized it was a V8 engine based on the, the topic it, very quickly as soon as it was swinging. But uh, for a second, I thought of the, the V8 juice. Is that V8? Is that my imagination? Anyway. Okay, well, let's look at, take, take a closer look at, um, at the pros, and then we'll look at all. And that's the way you have to do it. You kind of read through, see what you get with a haiku, and then sort of understand the poem through that. Um, and there should be a kind of leap. It's, you know, it's more powerful when you have a bigger leap, a bigger cut that still works. And I think this is a big cut from this scene of, you know, <laughs> drinking all night and then losing your job. Um, to this this uh, sort of second scene where the V8's swinging either as a Christmas ornament or from the tree limb. Um, yeah. So Dick says no, it was clearly an engine. Yeah, I think with the context it is clearly. But, but to me, I did flash the V8. Like maybe even before I read it, just out of the corner of my eye, I saw V8 and I thought of that tomato juice. Um, and I think maybe, I mean, I thought for a second too, maybe, you know, cherry red could be the color of the tomato. You could play with that intentionally and make more of the V8 as part of like the color or something, but I think it's better like this. I think that's sort of a distraction from what's really cool about the poem. Katie says, though, she's thrown off by the juice slightly. So that's something to keep in mind. And um, is there another word um, for that, like a big engine um, that you could use instead? Like, um, I don't know. See, I'm not a car person, so I couldn't come up with that. But But maybe there's another, you know, for the engine block or something or... Or, um, I don't know. Maybe there's something good that works, too, besides for V8, so they don't throw you off there. Um, anyway, let's see what else. Yeah. Let's see. Okay, well, let's read the, read the whole, whole prose again. The Cherry Red Camaro. Engine work done. I listen to my Camaro riff before I give us both a hose bath. I scrawl another X on the Valvoline calendar, and there I am, passed out, drunk again in the back seat, white castle sleeves stinking up the floor. See, I love that. Great description and details here. I mean, scrolling an X on the Valvoline calendar. I mean, there's so much that just feels. I mean, don't you know car people that are <laughs> like this, you know? Um, with, with all the specific detail, though, the white castle sleeves stinking up the floor. Um, you know, the, the one thing maybe... Um, yeah, you know, somebody who takes this much care of the car maybe wouldn't let that happen. But still, it's an, it's an interesting detail and makes it feel authentic. Last night, I begged the bartender to cut me off after three dink drinks, so she lined me th up three long necks on the bar like I was Joey Chestnut. So I have no idea who Joey Chestnut is. I looked it up. <laughs> Joey Chestnut. It's just a, I mean, there's a lot of references because, you know, it's a big world. Joey Chestnut, always oh, the hot dog champion, I think, right? Yeah, that... that, that um. Well, competitive eater, but he eats hot dogs, right? Yeah, hot dog eating contest. Yeah, so Joey Chestnut's the one that eats all the hot dogs. Okay, so he's won the 
um, the hot dog championship many times. Is going to say how many times? I don't know. He's the world's first. He's the world's first eater in the major league eating <laughs> contest. And here he has a picture of uh, of Joey Chestnut right here, just for fun. Joe, oops, what did I do? Joey Chestnut. There he is, and Joey with his championship belt. Um. So okay, so so she lines up three long necks on the bar like I was Joey Chestnut. I like that. That's really funny. Um, that works. Um. Um. Of course, I didn't stop. It didn't stop there. Sometimes walking, waking the next morning is like a nail gun fired into the webbing of my thumb. And I love that too, you know, because it's another transition to, um, you know, being a roofer um, by day and, a, you know, a drinking car lover by night. Uh, when my boss calls from the roof of a McMansion to see where I am, he tells me not to bother coming in anymore. I take this as an occasion to celebrate, maybe breakfast at the car track, burritos with the ghost peppers, and wonder if I really know what love is anymore. I call out to my wife, hey, Carmen, are we still living the dream? And uh, and then V8 swinging from a tree limb, Christmas ornament. Yeah, these are really nice. I, I think both these haiku are really nice. The only thing here, I mean... All these details in here are really interesting. I was thinking about like how we could condense it maybe, but the details work really well. Um, you know, the specific detail of being fired into an, an, uh, the webbing of my thumb and then the boss from a McMansion. I mean, these are just, this is really good, good details throughout. He tells me not to bother coming in anymore so we can imagine all that scene playing out. I take this as an occasion to celebrate, so there's a turn there. Um, maybe breakfast at the car track. I would say maybe, you know, because we already talked about the car so much, I would just maybe say the track and let that be open-ended. Um, a tiny detail to change, but but um, a little tiny contention. Breakfast at the track, burritos with the ghost peppers, and wonder if I really know what love is anymore. And it could end there, but it pushes a little farther to add the wife that he calls out to and, and the idea of living the dream. So there's a whole bunch that's more added to that. So I think other than that little, the car, I, I would just say the track. Otherwise, I would leave this really condensed. And, and here too, um, that's really good. Maybe find a different word. We, we changed ornament. Uh, we changed decoration to ornaments. I, I think I agree. It, it grows on me more. Maybe a different way for V8 or maybe not. Think about that. Because it doesn't, it can't just be an engine block. I mean, the idea, uh, because it has to be something that you would, if you loved cars, um, maybe like chrome engine would work or something like that. But it has to be something that's like beautiful enough that you would hang on a tree or it could just be um, hanging from the actual tree outside because you, um, you know, can't afford a, a lift or whatever they call them. Um, engine, engine rack, whatever that is. Um, so it can't be just some, you know, like ratty old engine. It's got to be something really nice. You know, V8 kind of implies that maybe but maybe something else instead. The only, only issue there. And then here, I think um, the cherry red Camaro, I think maybe um, just so there can be more sort of ambiguity within the poem, I would consider changing this to just cherry red. And so we don't really know. It leaves it, because we have the engine work done right away. Um, I listen to my Camaro riff before I give. So we have the engine and the Camaro right away. And so if it's the cherry red Camaro, it's kind of a, it feels a little redundant and not as interesting. But if we say cherry red, which I assume is the color, I mean, I don't know what it is, what it's going to mean. Eventually, I'll know that it's the color and I'll say, oh, it's the color. And so that adds detail as we refer back to it. And cherry red too, and like there's, you know, the cherry on top, that type thing. Um, there's that kind of concept. So it leaves a lot more open-endedness by shortening the title. And I think that might help just a, a little bit. It's great. Um, already, but I think that improves it just calling it cherry red. And those are the only things I can really think to change. So, um, so good stuff, Tom. And it's fun talking about Hyben. I really like Hyben as a form. Uh, let me see if there's any other comments before we move on. Jenny Van Breda says, overall dark but interesting. Nate Jacobs says, another haiku end, breeding breaks later. V mix, V8 mix too red, Christmas ruined. <laughs> um, Yes, yeah, so, so to go back to something I saw a real engine this is not the life of the backyard rough riding mechanic. That's how that's what I saw too. I, I so so what I saw out of the corner of my eye, I saw, you know, V eight the drink is coming, but then I realized as soon as I saw swing that it was that, and that's what I saw. For the rest, did not see the Christmas ornament. I thought of it as like, like um, you know, like Carmen said, put up the did you put up the Christmas lights yet? And he was like, yeah, the tree's decorated and it's just the engine. <laughs> um, but anyway, it's it's a fun. Um, 
yeah it's a fun poem um Genevieve embrace this cherry red could be blood let's see Paul Mitchell Burgess says Chevy V8 here. Um, I don't know. It's got to be something that that both sort of, I don't know, that, like could be either. Hmm. Yeah. And you don't want it too many syllables. Like the, the brevity of this is great. So I really like the, I mean, maybe the V8's just fine. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, let's see. So somebody, uh, Rose Lenard says, just a thought, how would this uh, look as a conventional poem rather than a hyben? Love it as it is, just wondering about how we chose one form or the other. And the thing that makes the hyben nice are these big cuts, these big leaps that you get to take. Um, and the thing is, the point, which I tried to show in a different poem before, is um, you can do these kind of leaps. Like you could just lineate this, maybe tighten it up even more to get it more in a prose style and call it just a regular um, free verse poem, even though you have this, you know, this part here. But by breaking it off, you sort of allow sort of the sense of like expectation and like who knows what's going to come. And then it is something that's like a really far leap. And then you get this leaping feel. Uh, which I think works really well, and so I think it. I mean, I think, I think it works well in this form. It allows you to be a little looser and freer with the prose too, um, but it could work as a regular poem too. You know, it really could, and and that's the kind of the point of Hyben is that it shows how you know real typical poems work. It's sort of like um, the blueprint is like out on the table instead of like burying that. But so many poems. I mean, if you think about. The, um, you know, the if it was a sonnet and you condense this to the first eight lines and sort of stretch this to the next six, and then this would just be the volta. And, you know, if you thought of any poem, there's some kind of arc. We say a poem has to go somewhere. Going to a leap is what a poem is really doing. It's sort of a leap of the imagination saved on the page. And so it just sort of shows it happening in a way that is um, is very transparent, I guess. Um, and by being transparent, it lets you leap a little farther, maybe, and feel a little less disconnected because you know the leap is coming. But this is still the way a poem operates um, in, in most cases. Let's see. Okay, let's move on because it's uh, gone a little too far. Um, let's look at the uh, next poet. But, but thanks for sharing those, Tom. The next is uh, Charlotte Kaus, who uh, is here live from the UK. And I should say halfway through, if you haven't clicked the like button yet and you're watching on YouTube, please do click the like button. I know it's easy to forget, but it does help. The more sort of likes to views we have, the more it shows up on the little sidebar, then more people see it, and then they get to be better poets too. And so we all get to, the whole world benefits from the uh, like button clicks. Now this is um, Charlotte uh, Kaus. And this is number five. So here we go, number five. <clears throat> number five. You want to smell clean, but you smell of smoke, and you can't sleep after smoking so many galoises that you still kick like a colt at midnight, and you're too thin, no blood to rest your spirit, flitting around your salon, fingers twitching on your curios, lion's head, Lenormand cards, number five facing up, crystal balls, occluded, smoked, your hand a flesh, a flesh smear on the other side. Your lover's heart was a hailstone in September when he fell to his knees in Roca, Rocabrun on the tennis court facing the med which looked as if you'd strewn it with your diamonds. Real and fake, they shine the same. And since then, morphines clasped your arm, led you to sleep, always on plain sheets like those in the convent, which smelt of Marseille soap. But the ones you sleep in now are scented with smoke. Hmm. Well, that's interesting. Number five. Rose Lenard helps me out with gloss. Thank you. And Dick Westheimer, too. Yeah, I mean, reading things live on a, on a stream, you get to show how ignorant you are. I had no idea. I assume that's a kind of cigarette. That was my contextual assumption. Um, because you're smoking so many. And I assume it's a French cigarette where you have other French places that are coming up. I think Rokelburn, I don't know how to say that. Isn't that a town? That's a French city, right? Um Yes, Tom Barlow says number five, perfume. Do do people know what um, Lenormand cards are? 
I only happen to, I, I don't know if that's, there's, there's a friend of mine from high school who became a psychic and there, there's some kind of like psychic deck cards. I remember that from, from seeing that. And I think, you know, number five facing up, I don't know if they're numbered, but then with the crystal ball, I'm pretty sure that's what that means. Roburn for this says, uh, really Roburn. So you, you skip all the Roqua. Okay. Roburn, um, there but anyway but do people know what those are or or is that because i think mm, anyway yeah so there there are a few references you have to look up my personal thought um is that um oh that reminds me i wanted to say one more thing somebody asked i can't see it about the hyben how tom says um a hyben here and whether or not that's a convention. And I think it could go either way. I think generally if you're publishing it in a journal that doesn't publish, you know, there's, there's all this whole array of haiku journals. They would know what a hyben is. You don't need to say it there. Um, but you might, I think I would do it if I were submitting to sort of a traditional, like mainstream, as if that exists, poetry publication, I would say hyben, just so people who are not used to it in the form maybe knows what it is and can go look it up. So I think that, I think that in most cases is helpful. I think unnecessary for like a, a you know, publication that focuses on haiku. And, uh, and, and so just either way, I think probably cut it off or maybe they wouldn't, I don't know what they would do. Um, if somebody has a copy of one of those haiku journals around, look at if they say hyben, I don't think so. I think they have a hyben section usually. Anyway, back to uh, number five. So, so I think number five is the card. Yeah. So James Langford never heard of them. Um, Dick Westheimer says that, uh, Galois are the sort of the French equivalent of lucky strike, <laughs> which is the, uh, mixed with cheap cigars. Lucky Strikes were my softball team for some reason. I have a Lucky Strike jersey. Um, I don't know why we picked that either. Um, let's see. So Katie Dozier says, I go to both the perfume and the demuth painting after William Carlos Williams. Oh, yeah. So there's the um, the famous William Carlos Williams poem number. No, isn't that number eight, the figure eight? Or is there number five one too? Um, or is it the figure five? Gosh. William Carlos Williams, the figure. It's the great figure, right? The great figure. It is the great figure five. I was wrong. This is one of my favorite poems. This is actually the poem um, I, I love. Um, somebody not too long ago asked what I like to teach kids with or how I, I can't remember if it was um, on the Rattlecast or somewhere. I think it was on the Rattlecast. We were talking about that. Maybe with um, Partho, uh, Parto Sereno. Uh, but I think, but I love showing kids this poem because it's such an easy poem for them to emulate. This is, um, here we'll put it on the screen. The Great Figure by William Carlos Williams. One of my, it's a great little tiny poem. I'll, I'll read it. Why not? Among the rain and lights, I saw the figure five in gold on the red fire truck moving, tense, unheated to gong clang, siren howls, and wheels rumbling through the dark city. So, um, and yeah, yeah, kids love that because they can just sort of just picture something and describe it, you know, and it's a really good way to get them writing concrete images. But anyway, um, so the, the, does number five there fit? Um, the question um, that Charlotte had was, does my language sound natural and do the metaphors and similes work? And in the case of number five, should I say what is about or leaving as a riddle for the reader? I think to me it's too riddle because we don't know. You know, I think this is a, you know, because the number five is facing up. I think it's a card in this deck, which is like a psychic deck, like what a medium would use. But it's not the traditional, what's the other one called? The, um, you know, with the, the beggar and the um, the the other deck, <laughs> whatever. Um, uh, but it's similar to that. And then we have the crystal balls. Um, so I think that's what it is, but we, we're still kind of confused. You know, there's a bunch of options and no one really knows. And I'm not even sure what that's referring to or why. What it, why. Um, and so I think definitely it lacks clarity in that regard. And then there's a lot of stuff. I like looking things up and a lot of people knew what those were. Um, you know, it's a place, you know, I love a lot of the details and images. It is a little hard to follow. Um, I, you know, the thing is, I guess I'm saying that I like, I like looking up stuff. I don't know. It's kind of fun when the poem sort of hangs together either way. Um, and it sort of adds a layer, but here I'm, I'm having a little too much trouble following exactly what, is going on, but I like the details. It feels a little bit, um, um, you know, a little John ashbury in the way, like John Ashbery, when he writes and, you know, he was sort of popularly loved or hated <laughs> by readers, but he sort of assumes you get every illusion and doesn't bother like letting you in. 
And, you know, there's a, there's something nice that sometimes if there's enough that it hangs together where, like, as you're exploring and, like, seeing more details, it's, like, making, it's sort of adding on. It's, like, additive when you have to go look something up instead of, like, you have to look it up to solve the riddle. And um, so it's, this leans a little too confusing to me. Uh, but it's, it's, it's interesting, though. Uh, let's look in more detail. Um, number five again, and I th- what we don't really know exactly what that means. You want to smell clean, but you smell of smoke. So I don't know how, who the you is. I guess maybe that's the big problem. And I know that you, you know, your lover's heart was a hailstone. So is it the same you and their lover later, you know, who, you know, falls in the tennis court too? I guess it's all the same you. It feels like a really specific person. And somebody falling on their knees in a row burn, if that's how you pronounce it, uh, Paul, um, facing the med. I'm not sure what the med is. There's a lot of stuff that I'm not sure what the references are. That feels like if you were falling on your knees, you won the tennis tournament. Um, But also, the I, I love this description, too of the diamonds real and fake. Cause if you look at the a tennis court, the hard court from a certain angle, there are these little diamonds. There's a gritty sort of sand that they add to make it give a lot of traction for the ball. So that the slices sort of cut and break hard. And, um, and if, you know, for the sun hits right, there is a sort of diamond sheen, which is great, but the courts in France are famous for being clay. So that's a little confusing too. And then why the person's dying. And the, so it's just, I love the details, but it's hard to follow exactly what's going on. And do we, do we, Get enough out of the poem to, to not mind that we're being lost, I guess, is the question that comes up. Mary King says med is just Mediterranean, facing the med, like the Mediterranean. Hmm. Oh, so does the Mediterranean look as if you'd thrown it with diamonds? That's interesting. I thought it was talking about tennis court. Um, so Phyllis um, Chiray says... Um, Maybe title to somebody so we know who the two is, to the you is, or dear somebody, or something like that. Like, make it like that, because it is written as, like, an epistolary poem. Um, and then that would help us figure out sort of the context a little more. Sharon Francis is covering up the smell of smoke with a perfume, uh, but I'm a little bit lost. Yeah, and it's just hard to follow. The great details, but hard to follow. Nate Jacobs says the references here are cool, but perhaps too many and too obscure in quick succession for me to stay in the poem. Um, let's see. Yeah, and so Lenormand cards are French fortune-telling cards, which are numbered. I'm describing the objects that Chanel had in her salon. Number five was her lucky number, and she had the card face up in her salon. Oh, that's interesting. So Chanel number five... Is, is that is that why there's Chanel number five is the perfume? Is that I, I guess it must be. Um, hmm. Well, that's interesting. So there, so there's a lot here. So, so who is the you? I mean, maybe if we could find if we knew who the you was, could it be? Um, is there more explanation? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I just feel like it's too obscure. So, you know, Charlotte says here that the cards are French fortune-telling cards, which are numbered. So I'm describing the objects that um, Chanel had in her salon. So it, so if we got that, um, like if it was like to Chanel <laughs> looking at the objects in her salon, and then we would, um, then we could move on. Let's just imagine that was the title and then read the poem thinking about that. And, and who is... So let me look this up too, because there's a lot of stuff that I just don't know in the world, obviously. Um, um, sh- uh, let's see. No, I want to see like the history. So who? Ah, uh, sorry, I want to be quick, so I don't take everybody's time just looking at stuff. But is there more? Oh, Coco Chanel. That's right. That's who it is. Coco Chanel. Um, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, if you if you said it was two, you know, Coco Chanel looking at the objects in her thing. So, let's pretend it said that. And then now we know who the you is. Bam. You want to smell clean. Feel how much better that smells? Or <laughs> that smells. Sorry. How much better that feels knowing knowing who the you is with a title. Two Coco Chanel. You know, in your looking at the objects in your salon, 
You want to smell clean, but you smell of smoke and you can't sleep after smoking so many um, go. Oh, I can't remember how they said to pronounce it. Goes, something like that. Gawaz, <laughs> that you still kick like a colt at midnight and you're too thin, no blood to rest in your spirit, flitting around your salon, fingers twitching on your curios, lion's head, Lenormand cards, number five facing up, crystal balls occluded, smoked, your hand a flesh smeared on the other side. Your lover's heart was a hailstone in September when he fell. So now we know who the lover is too. It must be somebody who, um, you know, won a French tournament. Um, you know, the French Open, maybe, and then, um, or maybe not, maybe died of a heart attack. I don't know which way it could go. He fell to his knees in Rokeburn on the tennis court facing the med, which looked as if you'd strewn it with your diamonds, real and fake. They shine the same. And since then, morphine's clasped your arm, led you to sleep, always on plain sheets like those in the convent, which smelt of Marseille soap. But the ones you sleep in now are scented with smoke. So that's really nice. Knowing what that is, just changing the title changes the whole poem because we can access it now. And so I think that just fixes it. And the whole poem opens up this way, as Tom Barlow says. Yep. Yep. Oh, and Chanel number five uses extract from horseshoe crab blood. Oh, that's fascinating. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. And so Zayden Hunt says, I think the second person POV is a challenge here. Always difficult. And yeah. And so if we know who the you is, then bam, the whole poem opens up. Did the, did the um, lover's heart, did he have a heart attack? Or, or did he, or was the lover, is that some detail? I don't know if it matters. It's really great descriptions. And, and it evokes the feelings of, you know, visiting there and looking at that ephemera and thinking about um, that, you know, historic figure like that. Yeah, Rosenar says, makes so much more sense now. That's another poem. <laughs> Marseille is the right sonic. Yeah, so that so just fix this title. And it's really a great poem otherwise. I don't know if there's anything else. I got to move on. I don't know if there's anything else I would change in this except for, fix the title and then we can access it. But it took that long to, to get to it. And, and the truth is no one is going to give you that much time. <laughs> so we give a lot of time here because we're trying to, as a group, trying to come to terms with it. And then you told us too, um, Charlotte. So, you know, it's, it's too, too much, but then we li really like it once we get to understand what's going on. And so, so let us in, let us know more. Okay. Um, otherwise, I, th I think it's all great. I love the details. And once you know, so this is the kind of thing with, with knowing what the subject actually is and knowing what that who, what, why, where, when type questions. Um, you know, once we know that, the details that we don't actually understand, we can just go look up really easily. It's the 21st century. And that adds more to the poem, like what I was talking about. And so um, so Charlotte Cuss says um, uh, Coco Chanel's lover had a heart attack on the tennis court. That's great. Okay. Yeah. Very interesting. So so we can look up that. We can like, I don't know what that means. Oh, that's what it means. And then we just feel like it's more detail. It's enriching the poem, but we knew, understood it the whole way through. Um, and I think that works great. So, to, God, such a such a simple change to make the title something like that. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Um, Aiden Hunt suggests, I think a quote from Coco might be a good epigraph. Yeah, Catherine Rowe says, uh, I love this critique. So much of what I battle with as a poet is whether I'm being too niche and how to orient the reader. The title made all the difference. Yeah, it's nice to see how, how well that works. And the poem just like blossoms um, when, you, when you do that. Okay. So anyway, let's move on to the next poem while we have um, some time. And, and yeah, glad I looked over at Facebook too. Sorry, I forgot. Let's look at the other one too. And this one, now for this one, I gotta ask your opinion about this too, everybody out there, because um, Charlotte said this for me in her question. I continue. She says, I'm a white woman from a Christian background, but I sometimes write about Eastern culture. Do readers feel someone from this background can slash should write about another culture's religion, etc.? And so um, just in general, and this is my opinion, if it's done with knowledge and respect, then I think that's great and it can enrich us. If it's done with ignorance and, you know, disrespect and assumptions, um, then it's it's not. And it so it depends how much you know, you know. if I, I think, um, you know, I mean, to me, the genes that you were born with don't determine what you're allowed to write about, but what you care about and understand well does. And so it depends... You know, if you were immersed in the culture and understand it, if there's some reason, if you studied it extensively and you can open up a lot to us, I think that's great. But at the same time, our culture now, speaking of culture, um, 
you know, has a real hard time with it to the point where I know a lot of people who are scared to write persona poems anymore. When we did the persona poems issue, that was something that came up a lot. People said, I used to love persona poems, imagining to be other people, but now I feel it's too offensive to do that. And I, to me personally, I think that's a tragedy that we sort of cut off that part of our imagination because poems are little empathy machines and we trying to understand what it's like to be someone else is a great thing we can do as long as it's done carefully and with respect. Um, and you know, when you study the thing that you're talking about, you're not making in ignorant assumptions. And so a blanket statement that you shouldn't write about this, I don't agree with, but I, a lot of people, a lot of readers, um, would agree with that, that just, you shouldn't do it. And a lot of journals would say, you know, you shouldn't write about this. We had, um, there was a rattle poetry prize poem that we loved that the poet didn't, we didn't publish because, uh, when he submitted the poem in a book, the editor said they loved that book, but didn't want to publish that poem because it was talking about a different culture. And um, and he didn't want to publish that poem in Rattle. And, you know, that's just a way, it's something you have to be careful about and understand what you're getting into and um, make your own decisions. That would be my advice. Uh, but, but what does everybody think about that topic just in general? Um, you know, leave your comments here um, um, to, let, uh, to let Charlotte know what you think. Um, uh, but that's it. There's really no easy answer to it. In the meantime, let's look at this poem, which I, I'm really curious about. And there's going to be a lot of words I'm guessing how to pronounce. I can already see. So again, this is Charlotte Kaus with um, Barata and the Deer. In my last life, I was a politician, a good one. They named a city after me, its streets swept and beggarless. Even the stray dogs fur shone. But I walked away from everything, homes hung with mogul silks, the laughter of children in sunlit courtyards, my wife's body warm from dreams at dawn. I cast off my clothing like old lives and sat by the river Chakra, its waters washing over shalagrams, um, ammonites, sacred to Vishu, tightly coiled snakes in centuries deep sleep, and I meditated till my mind was a shoreless sea, thoughts darting away like silver fish. The Parabda karma had yet to fruit, and I was wrenched from bliss, a doe damp from a lion's breath leapt over the river, died beside me and out from under her living, a living fawn. I'd never seen anything so vulnerable. Wet leaf mulch eyes looking up at me. I fed him milk and later grass from my hand, and we walked in the forest, and when he tired, I carried his fine bones on my shoulders. And when I slept, he curled up by my flank, soothing my sleep with his pulse, and when I meditated, I saw him, nose black and wet as a shalagram. When death came, it was a storm, and my last thought was of my deer shaking in the rain, so I was born a deer. But a jetasmara remembering past lives, so I skitter through the mustard field to the banks of the Gen Gendaki, where the reishis are, to drink the water rippling from with their wisdom. So that's really interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, hmm. Yeah, so um, that, that's really interesting. I mean, it's so vivid, and it feels like you've researched. I mean, with the other one, too. I mean, look at how much research was in the Chanel number no. 5. Um, it feels to me like you know what you're talking about, and as long as you do, I think it's safe to do. And there's so many great lines and great rhythms, great music, great story here. Um, I was, uh, what was that? I was reminded of, um, too, the, the movie The Lobster. <laughs> which is a really strange, a strange sort of supernatural science fiction -y kind of movie uh, when thinking about this transformation too. Um, but very vivid and interesting. Yeah, Mary King says, lovely. Aiden Hunt says it has a watery flow. I like the sibilance. Um, yeah, jean Hunt Breda says, uh, wow, this is a very good poem, very ethereal. Um, yeah, uh, about the general question, um, let's see. Uh, Dick Westheimer, where'd that go? Um, yeah, Dick Westheimer says, uh, well said, Tim, F the mob. <laughs> and yeah, he also said, though, there it was, J just ask Anders Carlson we about what happens when you write persona poems. Pylon, yeah, I mean, you, it, you run the risk of doing that or having that done to you, and it's a terrible thing, but maybe the, the pylon mob kind of cancel culture thing is, is dying off. I mean, the, the Poetry Foundation still hasn't responded to that um, the boycott letter which I think maybe is the turning point when we stop sort of giving so much power to people's sort of performative outrage. 
uh, but that's a sep- separate point. Um, but anyway, the the point, I mean, this this is a really vivid, wonderful poem. As long as you know what you're talking about, I think it'd be fine to write. Let's look at a little more detail before we go. Uh, but this, these are both, I mean, all four of these poems, they have been great. Um, you know, once we unlock the other one. This one, I think, even if you don't know the details, this is kind of what I was talking about before with like a John Ashbery type poem where we don't really know what's going on. Uh, we don't know what a lot of the references are alluding to. There's so much illusion and we can like dig in later, but we still get a sense of the whole story. And so I think it's engaging, even though I'm sort of blowing past a lot of the words, having no idea what they mean, but I can look and learn later. And I like that aspect of it. So I think it's really nice. So I don't know what, I think Barata is maybe the, the main character's name, Barata and the deer. Uh, but I'm not sure about that either. I don't know what the reference is, but this is stuff I could look up later because the poem is engaging and stimulating. So I, I'm glad that I have stuff to learn. You know, I mean, we were, you know, learning is one of the main p- points of being a human, you know, and that we get to learn about something new is really fabulous when it's engaging enough that we're we're still with it the whole way. So I think it's great. In my last life, I was a politician, a good one. They named a city after me. Its streets swept and beggarless. Even the stray... So one thing, um, you know, talking about a different culture, using tropes from a different culture is something especially to be wary of. You know, if you're going to be, you know, careful about, you know, and the idea that the streets are full of beggars is maybe, you know, verging on one of those things, a kind of trope that you'd want to be careful about, especially if writing about someone else's culture. So there's that aspect of it. I think that was the only time when I got to that word, I thought, eh, I'm a little nervous, but it kind of, it, it doesn't seem to go anywhere else. It was just that one sort of concept. So, so be cautious about that aspect of it, I would say. Even the stray dogs fur shown. But, and I love that detail, even the stray dogs fur shown. That's great. And a great example of just the way that the richness of detail in the music come out. Even the stray dogs fur shown. There's a nice sound to that. Um, the, the musical rhythm is great. Uh, great lines. But I walked away from everything. Homes hung with muggle silks. The laughter of children. I think we need uh, a little more punctuation in places in the poem, so it needs a comma there. The laughter of children in sunlit courtyards. My wife's body uh, war- warm from dreams at dawn. Again, warm from dreams at dawn. This is You can tell that Charlotte is somebody who uh, reads a lot of poetry because there's that, that way that the, um, the, the phonemes are dancing across your tongue, which is something that that, that's what kind of we mean by music, but we don't really think about it in that detail. So, you know, warm from dreams at dawn. It, there's a great movement in your mouth to that phrase. I cast off my clothing like old lives. Again, <laughs> great. I cast off my clothing like old lives. That's great. And sat by the river chakra. It's waters washing over shilograms. I don't know what shilograms are. I think this is the one word I might look up before we leave because I'm curious. And I do have to get out, get going soon, but um, <clears throat> a shilogram is um, a fossilized stone. Let me see. Well, let's look at it. I can let you see it, too. It's a... Uh, oh, here we go. Yeah, so these are them. It's a fossilized stone, or ammonite, collected from the riverbed or banks of the Kali Gandaki, a tributary of the Gandaki River in Nepal. Um, it is also considered a form of Vishnu within Hinduism. So it's really interesting detail. Um, yeah, so there's a whole long story if anyone wants to look it up, but that's interesting. Okay, so back to the poem while we have some time. Okay, so, um, washing over shilograms, ammonites, it even explains it, sacred, but we don't know, um, oh, I think it's a typo, that should be Vishnu. Be careful about that, too, if you're going to write about someone else's culture, definitely spell, you know, get the whole... Be very careful. Be a little extra careful because you don't want to end, end up like Anderson Carlson, we or other people. You know, there's just a lot of anxiety and stress that comes out of that. There's a real sort of deep human reflex when you get attacked by a mob because you don't want to be thrown out of your tribe. And, um, you know, because that was a death sentence. So we sort of desperately cling to in-group af- affirmation, which is really the, what's going on with all of the uh, cancel culture mobbing. But you don't want to be part of it if you can avoid it. Um, cause it is, even if you say F the mob, you still have all of that, uh, all of those sort of, um, I don't know, those, 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 uh, neurological processes that make it, it feels like drowning to have be cast out like that. There's a real reflex that we have to not be excommunicated from our tribe. So we, on our own in the, you know, trying to survive without is something that humans didn't do. And so um, the people who desperately clung to their tribe and their in-group are the ones who survived. And so we all are desperate for that in-group validation. Anyway, 
Um, um, the laughter of children at sunlit courtyards. My wife's body. Wait, where were we? Down a little farther. The uh, yeah. So Vishnu, tightly coiled snakes and centuries deep sleep. I meditated till my mind was a shoreless sea. That's great too. The shoreless sea. Thoughts darting away like silver fish. And that's really wonderful too. I mean, just beautiful images. But the um, Pararabdha karma had yet to fruit, and I was wrenched from bliss. I mean, that's beautiful too. A doe damp from a lion's breath. One thing I wondered if a doe damp from a lion's breath is like too much. Um, I mean, like, the uh, imagining that that could be literally true. It, it seems impossible that the line got that close that the dough was actually damp. Because it's not really the line. I guess what it is really is a mixed metaphor, or a, like a mixed metaphor type, because it would be damp from like, well, do dough sweat? I don't know. Or what if you really damp? I don't know. I don't know. It, it, there's something a little strange about it actually being damp from a lion's breath to me. Um, and it leapt over the river, but maybe, it, I don't know. It, it, actually being wet from that, the line being that close without catching it seems impossible. Um, which struck me as a little strange. And out from under her, a living fawn. I'd never seen anything so vulnerable. Wet leaf mulch eyes looking up at me. Yeah, it's great detail too. Um, I fed him milk and later grass for my hand, and we walked in the forest. And when he tired, I carried his fine bones on my shoulder. See, now how nice is this? Like a word like fine. You know, we don't want to use a lot of adjectives, but a really perfectly placed adjective like that really adds to the our understanding and our feel of what's going on so beautiful use of that fine i carried his fine bones on my shoulders and to the bones on my shoulders and our great music great music throughout and when i slept uh, he curled up by my flank soothing my sleep with his pulse and when i meditated i saw him nose black and wet as a shallagram and we get that shallagram again um um i, I wonder if uh, I guess we, I don't know. Coming back is interesting. I wonder um, if we should do it twice or not. I, I kind of like it. Though. I think it's fine. The, when death came, it was a storm, and my last thought was of my deer shaking in the rain. Again, shaking in the rain is great, so I was born a deer. And hopefully that's how it works. <laughs> I don't know. Um, but a, a jet to smara, remembering past lives. So I skitter through the mustard field to the banks of the Gendaki, where the, where the rishis are, to drink the water rippling with their wisdom. It's just a beautiful story, and I, I like the movement of it, and I like the, the music. Um, I don't know. Is there anybody have any suggestions for changing anything? I mean, the only thing that Lion's Breath threw me out, just I, I wondered if it was a little too... Um, um, uh, just if it could be, you know... Genevieve and Breed says the line image fits with the mystic nature of the poem. It, it definitely does. But I think, um, I don't know, maybe maybe it's just something to me. I, I am one of those people who watch a movie and I think like, that couldn't actually happen. And it like ruins the movie for me. <laughs> and so there's a bit of it that. Maybe it's just me personally. Nancy Sobenick says, I think this is a very good poem, but may have just a touch too many cultural religious reference words that slow down the reading. Um... Let's see. Yeah. Dick Westheimer says, I love hearing this poem. Such great music. Um, Tom Barlow says, given the setting, would it be more likely to be a tiger than a lion? That's an interesting point, too. Another thing, too, about, you know, cultural references and stuff. If you're going to enter another culture, you have to get the details right. Um Um, Dick Westheimer says I had a native Ukrainian speaking folks check my chapbook for spelling and cultural references. I mean, that's a thing, too. I mean, I think there's a, um, you know, a lot of, um, you know, the, the, the idea of the sensitivity reader is sort of a, you know, overblown thing that's sort of turned as a, as a crutch in a kind of, um, um, you know, a, a mode of censorship. But there is a real, you know, valid reason to be culturally sensitive. And so having it somebody who is sensitive to the culture you're writing in is really important to make sure you get all those details right and that nothing's wrong. And you can't just talk to one person either because, you know, it's not like, you know, just if you live in the culture, you have the same opinions as everybody else. Like it takes a lot of perspective to see what might rub people the wrong way, what might be wrong. Um, and then, you know, once you know those details, you decide whether or not you want to keep them because maybe you do anyway. 
I mean, um, you know, there's just a lot of decisions that go into it. Um, but it is really interesting stuff. Is any other suggestions? Because I'm, I'm not, I'm, I, I really like the the poem, the story, the ending. Um, maybe. Um, let's see. To the banks of the Gandiki, where the Rishis are, to drink the water rippling with their wisdom. Is that a strong enough ending that's interesting enough? That, that's one of the things that, th does that carry, does the poem, the ending live up to the poem? That's one of the things I'm wondering. Um, hmm. Let's see. Yeah, as Nancy said, I think this is a very good poem, but may have just uh, touched too many cultural religious reference words that slow down the reading. I think this is an example of, um, you know, and I say this all the time, um, to actual people, like readers of Rattle, who write back to me during the day, you know, after we send our daily poem. But not every poem is for everybody. And some people will love a poem like this, and some people will find the references too much, and they don't feel like they can connect with it, they don't want to give it that much time. And that's okay. Not every poem has to be for everybody. Like, there's no one kind of poem to write. And that's a really important thing to remember. And one of the things that is weirdly true, too, is the best poems in Rattle... Um, the ones that have the most sort of energy and do the most and most people people love them the most also have people who don't like them. Um, and it's really interesting the you know because it sort of pushes a button and it's it's engaging in a way that maybe you don't want to be engaged. It sort of creates a kind of cognitive dissonance is what a, a really good poem does too. And some people flee that and don't like the feeling of having their boundaries kind of pushed against and it feels uncomfortable. And so they actively don't like a poem because it's so effective. And so when uh, I send out our daily poem at Rattle, the, we get the most <laughs> the most feedback, the most likes and shares on social media. The same days we get the most um, unsubscribes because people like don't like the feeling they got when they read the poem. And that's just the nature of it. Like some people are going to love your poem when it's good. Some people are going to hate it when it's good. And it's because it was like forced you to do something. It's almost like, you know, because a, a good poem is like it. It's like you know, punching you in the gut kind of like we even say that like it's like making you feel something that you didn't intend to feel. And a lot of people are turned off by having to experience that. It's like being forced to do something. It's like being remote controlled your emotions by somebody else. And when that's really done effectively, some people don't like it. Um, and so it's really interesting in that way too. Uh, and, and so you can't like write and try to please everybody uh, because you're gonna, some people are going to love it when you do it well and some people are going to hate it even when you write the best poem ever. <laughs> and so that's something to always keep in mind. So if it doesn't work for some people because it's too... Um, because it's too, you know, difficult and complicated, it might even work better for other people. So, um, let's see. Jennifer Brita says maybe less punctuation overall, um, or uh, shorter lines could possibly help the flow. I don't know. I like the size and the flow of it. We do have a lot of the dashes, uh, but but I, I think that worked really well. Um, hmm. Yeah. I think I, I got to get going anyway. It's It's past. I promised I would only do an hour today we got a very busy time going on um but let me check the comments yeah okay well anyway yeah let's just wrap it up here but but excellent work i wish i had more suggestions i think this is just you got to find the right home for it you got to be careful you got to fact check and you know make sure you understand really the content but it's a really well written poem um and, and the other one is too the other one you know just unlock it with the title but otherwise, that's that's great, too. So we looked at a lot of good poems today. And, you know, we could tighten up a little bit for Tom Barlow's Hyben, but they were great Hyben, um, both of them. And um, I think this is just a, a set of four really good poems. And I think they're all going to be published, you know, just a matter of sending them out somewhere. So thanks for sharing those to Tom and Charlotte. That is going to wrap up the uh, critique of the week for today. Um, let's see. So next week's guest on the Rattlecast on this Monday coming up is going to be... Yep, Bob Hickok is going to be here, uh, one of the few. We don't often have poets come back. We had a couple repeat poets. Bob was the last person ever um, right. to be on the Rattlecast before I had a camera that the guests could look at, so he was sort of awkwardly talking into space. It would be nice to actually for him to see me as we're having a conversation this time. Um, he has a new book, Water Look Away, which is um, a, very, it's a very tight, concise, little narrative-type book that moves through... Um, the main character's wife's suicide 
Um, but he's not going to read from that book. I might ask him to read one poem just to sort of get the feel of it. I'm not sure he will. He wants to read newer poems because he always does because he's Bob Hickok. But he will be the guest for Rattlecast number 222, uh, one of my personal favorite poets from the point. I mean, he was one of the first um, favorite poets I had way back when he read, like, The Legend of Light uh, way back in, like, 1996. Um, and so it's really fun to have Bob on, one of the great teachers, too, at Virginia Tech. Um, the Bob Hickok, the prompt for this week, and I should have had this prepared. The prompt was to uh, write about a pain from your childhood using a refrain. So that'll be the prompt for the prompt lines, too, after we talk to Bob Hickok. That's broadcast number 222, Monday, December 4th, the regular time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Hope to see you there. Hope you have a great weekend in the meantime, and I will talk to you later. Goodbye. Goodbye.